Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. Well, hello and welcome to this week's Countryside with Kiri Kerwood and Simon Clark. And you've been kidding about. <laughs> kidding chaos. Uh, and you've, have you had much to do with goats? No, not really. Um, goat farming isn't really a big enterprise on the Isle of Man. And certainly at my own farm, certainly not. But... Well, Claire Lewis and Michael Walker have certainly got to grips with their goats in the north of the island with the boa goats for the meat and also the angora goats for the hair and they're making a real great job of it. Yeah, and it's great that they allow the, the public to come around and, and, and you know, understand goats a lot more as well, isn't it? Because they're so such a versatile animal when you hear them talking about them. Oh, they really are. And they're such a friendly animal. It's ideal for children to interact with them and also to learn b- between the countryside and the public um, yeah, how how important life is on the farms. Yeah, and it's been National Mills Weekend as well across the country. And uh, as part of it, the Sheen family down the south of the Isle of Man opened the doors of the Kentraw Mill. And uh, I went along to chat to some of the people who were showing the general public around and explaining how all the mill worked with its three floors of different activities and um you know the the way that the life was for the miller back then and such a a big area to cover as well you know from the sort of gansey up to the slock and things like that so very interesting chat uh in the program about the mills there so here it is sit back and hear about a bit more about goats and also uh, old mills dating back to the 1500s manx radio's countryside is brought to you by nfu mutual Well, National Mills Weekend. What's it all about? Not if your surname is Mills. It's to do with the old mills that were used for various items to do with the food production uh, many years ago and still today in a modern fashion, of course. Well, one of the oldest on the Isle of Man is the Kentraw Mill down near Gansey in the south of the island. And I popped along to see it actually working in action with a couple of new modern tricks, well, 50 or 60 years old. And I spoke to some of the people, the owners, also Peter Hughes, who was showing people around, but firstly, Roger Harper to explain its history. It's uh, that time of year again where the Kentrow Mill is open and it's great to see a lot of people taking interest in this fabulous exhibit of a mill. Oh yes, and it's great fun having everybody round. It is an ancient mill, it's one of the gems of the island actually. I worry about what's going to happen to it when the present owner gives up because it needs somebody that's going to love and care for it. And I don't think it's really something that is for the Manx National Museum to take over because they're not the right people to run a mill like this because the introduction of vast amounts of health and safety that you would have to put in to have it open all the time for the public would completely ruin the atmosphere of the mill because it is still a bit like the working mill really was rather than just a museum piece. When does it date back to? Quite a while ago now. Well, there's been a mill on the site that we know since the end of the 15th century. We know there was a mill here in 1500. The present building was refurbished in about 1832, re-roofed in 1896. But some of the timber about is obviously very, very old indeed, and the foundations will be very old indeed as well. Yeah, we're at the bottom part of it at the moment and uh, this is where where the, the big cast iron wheel is it that it, drives it? It's ca- cast iron wheel, the wallower wheel, mm. which takes the power and transmits it up through the whole of the mill, through a great big post as big as, big as a tree. <laughs> But th- there's a unique thing I heard you talking to the people who have been in, who have been interested in it, that the, even back then, you know, the, the, they couldn't just get one off a shelf to replace them big wheels if it broke. And there's a oh, bit of a fail-safe system uh, which is unique. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, it's not, it's unique in, in a way, but it, most of the mills had the same system in, that some of the teeth on some of the gear wheels are wooden teeth. So if anything went wrong, the teeth just snapped off and you could replace them quite easily without the having to pull the whole mill to pieces to replace a very expensive piece of cast iron, which would have to come from Liverpool, and then you'd be out of production for weeks because every, every one of these cast iron wheels would have been a one-off special wheel cast 
just for that mill. Right. Did, was there much that could stop the, the grinding wheels? Well, it would happen from time to time that there would be small stones in the grain. Mm. And the stone between the grindstones would just lock it solid. Right. And you can't turn the water off. The water wheel won't stop instantly. It will keep on going. So something's got to give. <laughs> What would be produced, what would be ground in this, uh, mainly oats, would it? Uh, this mill had three grindstones, one for oats, one for barley and one for wheat. The wheat would be the one that was put in last in the middle of the 19th century when wheat started being grown in the Isle of Man when they developed strains of wheat that would grow as far north as this. How many farms um, would it have just been... Certainly wouldn't have been the, the, the near neighbourhood ones, would it? <laughs> no, we'd run, run for some miles right up, up to the slock, as far as we right, can tell. Yeah. So it was, it was a fairly big area it covered. The mill, part of the feudal system, so the miller was not just the miller, he was also the tax collector too. <laughs> right, OK, in various roles. But this one it is um, just how it was, like you described before, and that is something unique, isn't it? it absolutely, absolutely. It's just and it, it been lovingly uh, brought back to life, in fact, by Elizabeth Sheen's father when he bought it in the 1960s. And he did it as a as his retirement project. And it still runs. It still runs. Well, should we go up and have a starter up? We'll start her up. So what I'm going to do is start the mill rolling with a bit of manpower and then switch it on. Well, Peter Hughes, uh, we're in it, the top floor of the mill here. Uh, he's been the telling story. the yes, telling the people what's been happening, and, uh, and must have been a lot of strong men in them days. There must have been mm. a very lot of strong. You know, they don't they don't look like us. <laughs> <laughs> They're all lean and mean. Yes, I think so. They worked very hard and very long hours and dark nights and still working quite often through the night. When you look around here, there's some simple devices which. They couldn't really do without, but they were so simple. <laughs> yes, it was designed to be as easy as possible and to make things that fitted with the job to be done, not, not making them complicated. Most of us can't work a modern camera because we don't know how half of it works, but these are very simple devices that do very simple tasks easily. The door mechanism here for the, for the bags coming up from the bottom on that chain and the doors were, were, were automatic, weren't they? Yes, absolutely. They, they opened with the sack coming up and slammed behind, and that meant there wasn't any problem of anybody falling down, and they would just keep doing that. Uh, and the three hoppers here that's for yeah. the different types of grain, wasn't it? Yes, the three hoppers, one for wheat, one for barley, and one for oats. Uh, not very much wheat was grown on the island until about the mid-1800s, and the main two crops were the barley and the oats. And they were grown for porridge and for flour and for animal feed. Which was the best floor to be in? Oh, I would think <laughs> the best floor to be outside looking in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it'd be a fair amount of dust and stuff. Oh, it? very but, dusty. Oh, at least you're inside. But the, the, the Sheens, they've done a marvellous job over the years, haven't they? You know, they so generous, letting it open to the public. Very kind couple, and they work tremendously hard to get this weekend off the ground. And they, they encourage all us uh, simple volunteers to come along and give a bit of time and it's so nice for people to see it open and operating. Well the owners of the Kentrow Mill, John Sheen and your wife, it's been fascinating again and very generous of you to let everybody out in to have a look around your mill. Yes. Well it, it's because we belong to the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings, Mill Section. And this weekend, internationally, right across Europe, people are invited to join in opening their private mills. So that's why we do. It's fascinating. And the story behind it as well, um, that when you open the doors to, 
think there was a car in there, wasn't there? That was my father, mm. yes, yes, mm. years ago, yes. And so he then immediately got interested and everybody who had mills, uh, Sir Clive Edwards and Mr Sullivan up the road, they all came buzzing down with how to make it work again and what everything was called. They spent four years getting it going as it is now. My parents, yes. Yeah, it must be rewarding to see a lot of people turn up. One oh, yes. was a wet day. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it rains, but there are hundreds, sometimes fifty. Does it surprise you the amount of interest that's shown well, in it? Well, it is part of Manx heritage, mm. isn't it? So mm. we expect the locals to take an interest in their own buildings. Mm. That's really yes. why. Mm. We are here and many people came during the year at, in odd little groups and all singly if they have a relation coming to stay could they come round and so we do open it all the year round just occasionally uh, privately and the train people who visited what a fortnight ago they 11 of them came round and they were very interested and of course they're very knowledgeable on things like machinery and so on so that that was fun to have them yeah and as in, a long time. you see a, a mill which has got its machinery installed and um, 500 years has been doing it is is something which is to be cherished and visited and so on yes shame to lock it away wouldn't it yes yes yes, yes. yes. Yeah. well it's been much appreciated and thank you very much indeed the period well thank you elizabeth and john sheen the owners of the kentraw mill they're talking to me and before that peter hughes and also roger harper with uh, that vast knowledge of that mill there not many people Kiri, i suppose know too much about them all and that of course dates back to 1500 and something just explaining the dangers and the the working life that them mills had uh, you not been to that one no i've not been to that no. one yet but uh the structure of them the building of them and everything that still stands to this day it was incredible how they built them it was, it's just fascinating to see them work again right up until this modern day of age it's yeah. just brilliant yeah health as you said health and safety might have something to do with it in this day and age but i suppose you know they had to dodge and weave and know which belt was where if you were working it every day wouldn't you that's it exactly and it has such a vital role to play producing the food for the people and for the animals and and the, the workmanship that went into it the hours they spent working them mills it must have been back breaking yeah it was and just three of them operating it and you know as far that was near where the obviously where the shore hotel is in port erin and you know they were carting it as far probably with a horse and cart uh, up to the slock oh, and yes. places like that and of course taking it back when it had been milled so uh, a fascinating life of, of the miller there <laughs> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. There's many different types of farming on the Isle of Man, but one newer type is goat farming. And I went along to Bolla Norman in Bolla Cry and Balaf to speak to Claire Lewis about their enterprise and their recent open day. We do this once a year at the end of our Easter kidding. We have a couple of open days. It's really for the people that couldn't get on the time sessions, so we just open it up and nobody has to book and... Just turn up and cuddle some goats and have a bit of fun. <laughs> We've been doing it for a number of years now. Yes, this is our third season of Kid in Chaos. And what do the children get from it? Because they, they are absolutely adorable. You know, they, what do they learn? Well, we take any questions, anything at all, you know, sometimes have a child that wants to uh, know a bit too much <laughs> <laughs> about what happens to a meat goat at the end. Um, for some, it's just, it's just cuddling a cute animal. But for a lot of people, they come because they really want to know why we're farming goats, um, what it's all about. They, you know, they see us on Facebook and things and um, want to know a bit more about it. But you keep two types of goats here. It's not just for the meat. No. At the moment, the herd stands at about three quarters are the Boer goats for the meat. And a quarter, which is today, is 63 um, purebred Angoras. And they're for their mohair fleeces. And you obviously, you rear the goats, the kid, and then you go the full cycle, you'll clip them, they take the wool and make them into socks, and now you sell them. We do. 
have to be very boring and correct you there, Kiri, <laughs> um, because goats don't carry wool, they carry hair. So technically, mohair is a hair, as is cashmere, all from goats, and uh, it actually grows very similar to human hair, so we have to shear twice a year, and we get about six inches staple length off each shearing. And are they similar to shear as a sheep? No. Mike and I were at the Great Yorkshire show a few years ago and there was the shearing demonstration and, um, and Mike said to one of the shearers, he said, uh, have you got any top tips for shearing Angora goats? And the guy just started laughing. He said, yeah, he said, my top tip is to get somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> so this is why Mike does it himself here at Bolly Norman then? Yes, Mike started off doing them all and we've gone full circle and now Mike shears them all, yeah. And genetics, obviously, it's the same with any animal, is something you have to concentrate on to make your herd better. Is this something you guys have been keen on? Very much so. Both Mike and I come from farming families where livestock breeding was, um, was a big part of what the family did. I grew up with beautiful pedigree Herefords in Hereford and Worcester. And we started off the boar herd with a very good commercial British boar buck. He's not pretty, <laughs> he stinks, but all the, all the goat ladies love him. And then we managed to purchase a very well-bred, more of a show buck. But when I say show, it, it was because um, his conformation was much better, he was much bigger, much, much wider, much deeper. That was Bertie. Lots of people would have seen Bertie. He was champion goat at the Southern Show. Used to walk around the ring on a halter, lovely, lovely boy. So he did the herd a lot of good in yeah. the genetics, but although his body conformation was fantastic, he carried a bloodline that gave him a very, very feminine head, which was not really what you want on your big stud buck. So lovely daughters, not great sons. And then more recently, we've managed to bring in the best of the Australian boar genetics. We have two young bucks who were born here last January and February, we know them as Pip and Squeak. They have got long show names, but they're Pip and Squeak. And now we have the creme de la creme of the boar world because we now actually carry a buck who's classed as a full blood and you can't actually get a higher registration than that. What it means genetically is that his bloodlines, both bloodlines on both sides all the way back, are full boar and he's never had any other goat breed bred out of him he's never had to because his genetics go directly back to the foundation boars in South Africa he's very different looking he already weighs nearly as much as our five-year-old British buck and he's only just turned two in March and genetically he might even top 23 24 stone when he's fully mature oh my word it's always been said that goat meat is a stronger smell and stronger taste. Is this true? No, not at all, not at all. I think goat meat gets that reputation simply because full fat goat's dairy can have a strong odour. Um, not if it's skimmed or semi-skimmed, but a lot of people will have tried a full fat goat's cheese and uh, it does smell like um, a dairy billy and have a bit of a rank, rankness to it. The meat is totally different. It doesn't have a goaty smell at all. It just has a unique flavour in the same way that beef differs from lamb, say, or guinea fowl differs from chicken. It's, it's different, but no, it, it doesn't have a, have a strongness at all. And it's obviously leaner as well. It's a lot leaner than lamb. Yep, the figures show that it carries about 10% of the fat that you'd get from your average lamb joint or carcass. It's lean, but it's not, not an old meat. So it's not a lean, tough meat. Yeah. You export the, the hair off the goats to the UK to make your products. Has it been a, a big undertaking? Yeah, it's, it was quite daunting at first. I mean, we, we do, the own, do our own shearing, so we're producing well over 100 fleeces now a year. Those all have to be hand-picked and graded here. We pack them into big wool sacks and those get taken to the mill. It takes a bit of work to find a mill that will do it exactly as you want it as well. It's expensive per kilo, 
I don't know whether I'd bother doing it if it was sheep's wool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> all the sheep farmers out there. But I think it's like anything, and I think that other farmers possibly would do well to find a way that they can add value to their raw product. So I can sell my raw mohair fleeces for quite good money, but if I take them and put the time and the money in to make them into a better, more complicated product, then hopefully they will give me a better return. Well, you have a wide range of products on the go now as well, with your knitwear and the goat skins as well. Yeah, we do. Partly that is to, obviously, from a business point of view, you want to try and maximise your return on any one animal. But also, for Mike and I, it's about respect for the animal. I don't think any farmer, any livestock farmer, takes it lightly that at the end of the day, our products are from these live animals, which then have to be dead animals. So on all levels, it is just the right thing to do to use as much of that animal as you can. For me, it's about respect as well as maximising profit. I'm very, very passionate about my goats. I'm sure I bore people to death about them. (laughs) But... We do our very best for them from preconception right through to the day that we actually transport them to the abattoir for their booked slaughter time. And that is the way we want to run our operation. So we do the very best for our livestock from start to finish. And I I am sure and I know that there are lots of other farmers out there that that feel the same way about, about their breed, whether it's sheep or cattle, pigs whatever it is. Do the goats run hand in hand together? Do they get on as uh, two different breeds? No, (laughs) not at all. In the early days, we were a bit naive and we thought, uh, you know, a goat's a goat and um, you can put them all in together. Um, Obviously, you know, not not your boys, but, um, you know, put put all the girls in together. But no, the, um, the Boer goats, for them, it seems to be survival of the fittest and I'll hit you as hard as I can to get as much as possible to eat for myself and that's how the boars operate and they are thugs. The angora goats, whether it's because they're a very ancient breed and so literally for millennia they have lived as as herds, they actually get on together much better, they are much more gentle and so the only ones that we mix are the bucks because the big bucks angoras and boars they can look after themselves and they do coexist most of the time after a big punch up um <laughs> they they do then coexist for the rest of the rest of the summer before they go back to work are sheep completely different to goats yes oh, where do you start on that they need different fencing they need shelter they don't have lanolin in their coats they have very little body fat they need a very different feeding regime Um, I mean, we give our goats amounts of copper that would kill a lot of sheep. It's difficult to find vets that know much about goats, even in the UK. All the way through, they are different. And our research has shown time and time again that the only way to look after goats well is not just about the feed and about the housing and about the fencing. It's actually about the family bonds within your herd. So as part of being a good goat keeper, Mike and I have to know when we look at a goat who its nearest relative is. If it hasn't got a twin sister or a sibling, we have to know who the mother is. Our goats that are born this year, the girls that we keep to breed from, once they're weaned, they won't meet their mum for nearly two years. So they'll kid themselves in two years' time probably in the same barn they were born in. And then they'll meet their mum, who, if she's still with us, will have her kids on her. They'll all go out together. And now we sometimes have three generations of female goat going round as a little family. And do you think that they know each other? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Because they will greet each other and lie with each other. And they don't do that unless they're closely related. And you obviously know them all individually, these families. Every breeding girl we have, we know by sight and name, and that helps in our management of them. If Mike's up at the other farm and rings me up and says, 
I don't know, Coco's off, off colour. And he can say, well, just remind me, which one do I bring with her? Because if you bring a sick goat home into your barn for a bit of TLC, if you don't bring her nearest relative, she'll turn her face to the wall and die anyway. But they obviously, they're all individual personalities. They've obviously their own mindset. Do you see them being so different to each other? Yeah, I, su- I suppose all groups of animals have, have the alpha. And each year, although we have different breeding groups, there will be a top female goat in each group. I mean, the little kid I've got sitting on my knee at the moment, her grandmother, if you like, her mum's mum, was called Tank because she was 12 and a half stone. And when wow. she walked across a field, every other goat got out of the way. <gasps> Goodness. <laughs> Otherwise, she'd hit them. Yeah. So she, she, yeah, she didn't have a, a nice character, yeah. but she knew she was the biggest, she was the heaviest, and she got what she wanted when she wanted. You know, and that was her personality. So today it's the close of the, of the open days, but you will be back up and, up and running again in the autumn? We will this year be doing a small kidding towards the middle to end of July. Um, it's partly because we have a very small barn here, so we now have to split the herd and kid three times a year just, just to get the amount of kids that we need for the meat business. That was Claire Lewis of Isle of Man Goats in Balaf. Interesting, the different um, ventures that goats are for you know as you heard Claire saying and explaining some for the meat some for the for the hair for the hair yeah don't get it wrong <laughs> <laughs> do with somebody sell but it is interesting because we always think of goats I always thought of them as you know the old billy goats and as you know smelling and things but obviously they're the, some of the males that aren't castrated and things but when you see them small goats and you wonder the kids love them so much isn't it oh they're the absolutely wonderful animals they're so intelligent and they're so interactive as well they come and and they want to be cuddles and i think that's what claire is really enjoying is the educational side to demonstrate to the children how to look after these animals and also running it as a business an agricultural farming business with a boa goat meat and the angora hair it's a, a really great day out for the whole family there yeah and also the hair getting used for for the special socks and things like that you know they do you the world a good one you can wear them for a month not wash them this is right and they're so durable and they keep you warm as well and it's lovely to see that the whole of the goat is being used and what a great way to rear them and produce your own products from these goats it's yeah, lovely and, and it is uh, one of them worries, I suppose, when you experience that yourself, when you open your farm up to the general public to come around and have a look. But when you see the, the public walk away, all smiling and everyone's happy, it's well rewarding. It certainly is. And some of the questions that the children ask are absolutely fascinating. But it's that link between the, the public and the countryside that's absolutely vital. And, and Claire's doing a great job of, of doing just that. <music> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, has it uh, made you go out and buy a dozen goats now, Kiri? They really are a lovely animal and um, they're quite difficult to keep, though. They have a higher metabolism than a sheep, so I could imagine it could be quite difficult to to have them as a herd. But uh, they are a wonderful animal for children to interact with. And the products that um, Claire and Micah sell in there are just wonderful. Yeah, it's just just nice to see them out in that open space in the fields and the grounds they've got there. They just look so happy just trundling around, don't they? And say, not just the kids that love them. I think the parents do get a a real... (laughs) love for the animal and respect for them because I suppose you don't get the chance to see them close up very often do you? No this is it exactly and and there was lots of parents and adults there sitting around and enjoying them and the goats will come along and jump up on top of you they're really friendly and if you get an opportunity to go go on one of their open days it's really good spot. Yeah and of course I was at that open day at the mill the Kentrow mill and it was just fabulous and that big uh, cast iron um, cog that they had there driving the wow. mill so and I said you know if that broke they'd have to take it to Liverpool or get another one made in Liverpool specifically it'd be weeks out of action and that was a disaster in them days and what they did was to, to compensate it was you heard them saying that get that little small cog that was driving the big one and that was made of little wooden pieces so if it blocked it would just wow. shear the woods off and they replace them. So marvellous. It's even great back engineering, then. isn't it? Was that? Vital. We'll leave it there for this week's Countryside. We'll be back next week for more. So from me, Simon Clark. Me, Kiri Kumud. Bye bye. Bye bye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all new Super Fast Plus broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds, and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. 
So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click Shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.